know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And that song, though tough maybe it is to sing, it reminds us that God will strip everything away from us until we realize that there's nothing that will bring us satisfaction but Him and Him alone. Amen? And uh, I know that's tough, but uh, praise God for His provision of not just stuff and things, but relationship. And that relationship is, uh, is possible because of Jesus. And so we're here because of Him. So, amen? Good to see you guys. Good morning, church. Good to have you here. And uh, hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. I tell people, I didn't gain a single pound on Thanksgiving. I gained multiple pounds. So just just so the record's straight. So uh, good to have you here. Before we dive into the Word uh, this morning, uh, we have some new leaders to uh, appoint, to commission. So... Um, Two weeks went by and didn't hear a single thing about either uh, any of the candidates. So thank you for um, your uh, your participation in not digging up any more dirt that we already found. So um, uh, Brenda, come on up. John, come on up. Kelly, come on up. Uh, two weeks ago, we presented these three to you. Uh, we want to bring them on board as leaders here at the church. And um, I'm going to invite the leadership, current leadership up, deacons, elders, come on up and join us as we... Uh, as we lay hands on, uh, on these individuals, so grateful for them. As I think about Thanksgiving and what I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for a church that is filled with men and women who love Jesus and want to love others in that same spirit of Christ. And uh, you're looking at them, uh, some of them up here. So uh, I'm thankful for each and every one of you. And uh, I'm thankful for uh, leadership that's really good on the football field as well. John tore it up on Thursday morning. So... Um, just for the record, two games, married guys won both of them. So, uh, and I swear, the, 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 the single guys, they brought out, like, they brought out all-stars. They, so there were guys out there, I'm like, are you sure you don't play for the Ravens or the Dolphins? Or, certainly not the Cowboys. I mean, that's not, that's not the case. So, uh, but it's good to have you guys here. If you're curious about church leadership and you want to see where in the scriptures we get some of our criteria and qualifications, look at Acts 6. 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1. There is really a prescription there for what church leadership should look like. And it is comprised of men, men and women who just desire for the church to be healthy and for it to be unified and for it to uh, participate in God's work of expanding the gospel of Jesus Christ to, uh, to the uttermost parts of the world. And so uh, grateful to have all of these folks participate in that mission. So um, Kelly, John, Brenda, thank you for, for stepping up. And, uh, and serving in this capacity. And so um, um, I'm going to have Norm pray. And uh, why don't we stand up as a church. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. This might seem uncomfortable for some. Take your right hand and just extend it towards these folks. This is your spiritual way of saying we are, uh, we are in solidarity with this decision. And uh, I'm going to have uh, Norm, one of our elders, pray. you is after after the service just just come up maybe introduce yourself to brenda kelly john all of them uh and just say hi and uh and just get to know them and you're going to find that they're a true joy and uh something we've already discovered and we want to share with you so uh good to be with you guys turn your bibles to second john uh and also third john which both come after first john believe it or not i know how how ironic right and uh we're going to discover some really wonderful truths uh, kind of tucked away in the New Testament. Unexplored territory for some, probably for most. 
Uh, these are the clean pages in your Bible, just like the minor prophets were the clean pages in the Old Testament. These are the clean pages in the New because they're so, qu- they're so small, it's quick to pass over them. Uh, I call them the postcards of the New Testament. And uh, you're going to uh, hear a little bit more about the purpose and the meaning behind them here in a bit. But I trust everyone had a good Thanksgiving. Here's what's interesting about this past Thanksgiving, that it seemed like the talk uh, on, on, on talk radio, a lot of articles I was reading online, was how do you avoid the conversation about politics this Thanksgiving? It seems like that was the ultra-sensitive topic this time of year. And, um, and I, I kind of joked with our family that uh, it wasn't until about two hours into our time together that someone mentioned the name Trump. Uh, and then it just went downhill from there. But uh, no, it was actually a great time. But uh, you know, it's interesting. We come together Thanksgiving and there's taboo topics. You know, there's the things you don't talk about. I grew up in a family you never talked about religion and politics uh, until my parents came to know Jesus and they were the first ones in my family. And then, and then, boy, it just shook things up. But I don't know how it was for you this Thanksgiving, but maybe uh, everyone in your family kept the peace and no one talked about religion or politics. Uh, but what I like is that John is not afraid to insert into the discussion things that need to be discussed. And there's two topics before us that as much as the world may want to avoid, as much as we as followers of Jesus may want to avoid, we need to talk about them. And the two topics are these, truth and love. And uh, there must be a balance of truth and love in our lives as followers of Christ. Too often I've met believers that really fall to one extreme or the other. I've met people who are very much truthful but lack love. Have you ever met those kind of people? They can be very harsh, they can be very grating, and they don't do much to exude the spirit, the character of the love of Christ. Because they're so truth-driven, they don't mind running roughshod over people in their lives. But then on the other end of the spectrum, I meet people who are really heavy, heavy with the topic of love, but they lack truth. And what happens is then you get a very soft Christianity with really no convictions no moral absolutes and that definitely doesn't reflect the heart of god either because he's a god who has given us parameters and boundaries when it comes to our lives and so what does that balance of truth and love look like well these are the letters of second and third john so turn your bibles there if you would and we're going to look at these two small postcards written to the early church some two thousand years ago and we're going to notice two themes this morning that i want to unpack with you the first is this that we are to abide in truth this is the message of second john and we are to act in love this is the message of third john and so as best as i could i took these two letters this week and i I believe i summarized kind of the greatest hits of of truth that's found here and each really deserves a separate separate message on its own but today we're going to tackle them together And I think one of the reasons they're so short is because of the urgency that is contained in the message in both of these letters. John didn't want to pen a long letter. He wanted to get a quick postcard off to deal with urgent matters that were going on in the truth. Second John not only praises believers as they abide in the truth, but he cautions the early church to stand up against false teachings which is why truth is important. And then in 3 John, the, the, the brevity of the message is really about showing love to people, uh, showing hospitality to people, and, and helping in, in giving to, to those that have need the, the advancement of the gospel. And so we are to abide in truth and act in love, and that's the message of these two books. So let's look at first, uh, 2 John first. And uh, let's read the 13 verses, and I want to point out a couple truths that are found here. So John starts in 2 John, and says, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. For the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace and mercy and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Now notice those first three verses how much the word truth shows up, right? John is really heavily emphasizing the importance of the truth. Remember, in his gospel account of Jesus, it's in John 14, 6, that we get the famous phrase of Christ that I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. See, John knows about the truth, not because he knows it in his head, but he also knows it in his heart because truth comes via a relationship with him who is the truth, Jesus. And so he writes to this church and he identifies himself as the elder. Now imagine that. He's not just an, an elder, he is the elder. And I will tell you, these were the last letters written in the New Testament. This is, this is multiple decades after the time of Christ. John's probably in his 80s or 90s, so he has every right to call himself the elder because he's the only surviving disciple, and he still has authority over the churches. And so as the elder, he's speaking as from one who has authority to, and who's he write to? He's writing to the chosen lady. Now, you're thinking this might be an individual, and, and I love this phrase because it reminds me of the time my wife and I were guests at a primarily black church in, in, in the east. And we walked through the parking lot and there was a sign that said, parking for the first lady. And my wife goes, ooh, I kind of like this church. And I asked the pastor what that was about because I was unaccustomed to some of these traditions. And they said, well, not only does the pastor of the church have his parking space, but his wife also has a parking spot. And my wife goes, that's it. You're going to call me first lady from now on. So if you see parking for the first lady out front, you know who it's for. So don't you dare park there, all right? But this is not who he's talking about. He's not talking about an individual person. He's actually addressing the church in general because church in the New Testament is feminine. And that is why Paul calls the church the bride of Christ, a feminine title. Here John chooses to call the church the chosen lady and not just the chosen lady, but her children. There is a local congregation John is addressing in all the little satellite campuses of the church to this region that he's, he's writing to. So basically, because the church at this time didn't have buildings, they met in houses. And so the letter was delivered by hand to this myriad of house churches in the first century A.D. And he's writing to them. Why? Because he's, he's saying there's, there's the emphasis and the importance of the truth. Now notice he uses this greeting in verse 3 that I love. Notice the three words he uses as he greets the church. I greet you with grace, mercy, and peace. Now you're going to see very similar Greetings in the writings of Paul as he opens up his letters. I love how the writers of the scripture emphasize these three things. Why is grace important? Because grace is being given that which you don't deserve. Why is mercy important? Mercy is important because God withholds exactly what you deserve and doesn't give it to you. And why is peace important? Because when you experience the grace and mercy of God, there's a peace that now settles upon your life, and peace thus becomes the character of our salvation. To know that God has accepted you because He is gracious and merciful, there is nothing but peace that should pervade your life. Amen? And we can talk about a whole message right there, but we're not going to. Then he says, I'm coming to you with this message of truth, verse 4, And I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. He writes with joy, because the first blank in your notes has to do with this, practicing the truth. He is thrilled to address this church and commend them, because they're walking in a way that reflects what they believe. Their belief has have impacted their behavior. And when it comes to the truth, it doesn't mean anything to merely know truth. What really matters in the eyes of God is if you're walking in the truth. This is what we mean by practicing the truth. And John says, I am glad to find some of you doing this. And it delights the elder's heart. It delights the pastor's heart when he hears that his people are walking in the truth. We're going to get to this in 3 John again, but I want you to know something, that there's probably nothing that delights my heart more than to know that the people that I've called the pastor are walking in the truth. That there's a good reputation of you out there, and the thing that comes forth, the thing that shines the most, is the fact that you guys love Jesus, and you want to honor him with your lives. So you want to know what, 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 what brings me the greatest joy? Is when you obey the Lord. 
And there's nothing probably that brings you greater joy than to know that your pastor and church leadership also delights in the truth and obeys the Lord. Amen? And so he writes and he says, I rejoice in this. And he says in verse 5, And now I ask you, lady, not as I'm writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Notice he doesn't separate love from truth. The two work hand in hand. And when it comes to truth in our, in our midst, it is important that we have truth direct our relationships. See, truth is not the enemy of love. Truth is the very thing that helps us strengthen our love for God and with one another. Because there's some out there that would use truth as this, it's like the bad guy, and, and, and love is, is the thing that accepts all actions, all behaviors, and, and how dare you tell me how to live my life, because that's not loving. And there's people out there that would basically use love as an excuse for immorality, and that's not biblical at all. The, the verse doesn't go, love covers a multitude of truths. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, when love and truth walk hand in hand in any faith community. Love can only be strengthened and it never compromises the truth and it only magnifies the love that God wants to to birth in that family. That's what John is referring to here. And notice how he connects love and the truth. Look at verse 6. And I want you to highlight this verse because this is great. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. Notice he isolates perhaps one of the greatest truths found in his letters. He says, you want to know what love is? Yes, Tina Turner, I want to know what love is. Or foreigner, sorry. I want to know what love is. Here's what love is. Love is walking according to God's commandments. When you obey God, you are loving at your utmost. When you're obeying God, you are exhibiting a love that is unrivaled, unmatched. That's why in 1 John chapter 5, he says, we find that God's commandments are not burdensome. We don't see God's commandments. We don't see God's truth as, really, God, you want me to do that again? You want me to act this way? You want me to speak this way? You want me to spend my money this way? How dare you? And we, we treat as if his truth is an imposition on our lives. When in reality, when you love God, you're loving his truth, and you find that his law, his commandments, his word is not burdensome. As a matter of fact, the psalmist says his truth is liberating. His truth is freeing. His truth is beyond anything you've ever experienced in life. So when you practice the truth, he is saying that believing and obeying go hand in hand and there's nothing like it. And I will tell you, Christian, this, that the more you're exposed to God's truth, the more you're responsible to God's truth. There's no doing this. La, 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 la. I can't hear you, Lord. La, 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 la. I mean, isn't that sometimes why we want to avoid church or church people? Because if they're truly loving the truth, we know something's going to come forth that may challenge us in our lives where we're at. And I'm going to tell you, that's not a bad thing. Because I don't want a community that's soft on truth. I want a community of people that are going to strengthen my walk in Christ because the truth is present and the truth is directing our steps. Amen? You remove the truth, and guess what? This just becomes one big coffee club on Sunday morning. You remove the truth, just this becomes another context in which we can say, boy, the Cowboys really suck this season. You remove the truth, and this just becomes another time of saying, hey, how's the crossword puzzle? What did you get for six down? You know, when you remove the truth, this does nothing that differentiates us from the world. But when we involve the truth in our mix, this separates us from everything else going on out there. This is why we are called to practice the truth. And so the church now serves as a place where when the truth is present, we are all transformed by it. And so John continues and says, this is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. God wants nothing more than for you to obey his will. And he doesn't call for blind 
half-hearted obedience. He calls for a heart that truly says, thank you, God, for what you've given to me, and I would choose nothing but delight in the law of, 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 from you. There's nothing more important than that. Just like our children. We delight nothing more than this, them obeying us because we know what's best for them. And God says, I know what's best for you. So the second point, though, as he shifts gears in verse 7, he says, not only are you to practice the truth, but you're also called to protect the truth. There's, a, there's, a, there's an importance of protecting the truth that we really need to focus on, John says. Look at verse 7, because he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, again, for those of you kind of licking your lips and going, ooh, Antichrist, we get to talk about end times. Let me burst your little joyful bubble right now and tell you that there is, according to my eschatology, my view of end times, there is no Antichrist other than the people who generally oppose the Spirit of Jesus. Biblically, you cannot put a, put a, put a finger on one specific person. For some of you, you go, Donald Trump's the Antichrist. No, he's not. Some of you are saying Obama's the Antichrist. Some of you are saying, you know, Kim Jong-un is the Antichrist. Some of you are think, saying, you know, maybe number 11 is the Antichrist. I don't know who you think is the Antichrist, but the Antichrist is anyone who opposes the spirit of Christ. This is why he says there are many deceivers out there. They're trying to get you distracted from Jesus, and anyone who does that is of the spirit of the Antichrist. Watch yourselves, he says in verse 8, that you may not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive full reward. He says, I want you to focus because the teachings of these false teachers is horribly skewed. It is horribly wrong. Look at verse 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not uh, abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So let's stop right there and just, just take a quick little inventory. So what he's literally saying in these few verses, he says, you need to be careful with your association of people who are clearly teaching things contrary to what we have taught you as Jesus' disciples. And he really hits two categories. There's two errors that he talks about here. The first one is a misunderstanding about Jesus. And the second is a misunderstanding about the Bible. Verse 7. They attack Jesus, specifically the incarnation. Now, isn't it ironic that we're coming upon the Christmas season? Here's the Christmas holiday right around the corner where we come together to once again recognize that the Christ has come in the flesh, that God has come near. And now in Jesus, we have the perfect embodiment of manhood and Godhead. And they attack the incarnation. There are obviously false teachers in, in, in John's day that wanted to diminish the character of Christ. I'm going to tell you right now. If you take away from the character of Christ, his virgin birth, his deity, his resurrection, you destroy the biblical Jesus and you have emasculated the Messiah and you don't have salvation as clearly taught in Christ, uh, in the scripture about Jesus. Okay? Jesus is important. Would you not agree with that? Jesus is perhaps the most important theology that we can embrace we call it christology the study of jesus and any group that attacks the character the nature the person the work of jesus is not what we call falling within the orthodox beliefs of christianity they are either a cult or a false religion and you want to know who that is don't write these down. The list is far too long. It's Hindus, it's Buddhists, it's Muslims, it's Mormons, it's Roman Catholics, it's Jehovah's Witnesses, it's New Age, it's blah, blah, blah. Whatever you want to fill in the blank there. Only Christianity embraces a solid theology of who Christ was, what he did, as reflected in the Bible. Don't believe the lies. Even though, boy, these people can be deceptive. If you've ever talked to someone associated with the LDS church, they use the same language we do, and boy, is it confusing. You know, my daughter has a friend who is Mormon, a very good friend, and I'll tell you what, to navigate the conversations with my daughter so that she could have a positive influence on her friend because the conversation is, well, they say they believe in Jesus. 
They, they, they talk about the Bible and all these things, and yet what they say about Jesus is completely wrong. It is completely in disagreement with the New Testament. Jesus has come in the flesh, and he has always existed. It's not like his deity started when he was born and then left when he was crucified. This is stuff that John, John's dealt with already. What we believe about Jesus is important. And you need to become great students in understanding who Jesus is. Read the Gospel of John this week. Make that your, your time in the Word to study. Because John elevates, exalts the person work of Christ. You'll have a greater understanding of who Jesus is if you read the Gospel of John. Secondly, there's a misunderstanding about the Bible. Because not only are they attacking the, the person of Jesus, they're attacking the teachings of Jesus. And I'm just going to call that the Bible. Because here is the word, Christ, the embodiment of all truth that God wants to reveal to the world. And yet they're questioning the teachings of Jesus. They're questioning the teachings of the Bible. And I'm going to tell you right now that 32 years of studying this book, I have yet to find something that really causes me to question my faith. There's 66 books here from Genesis to Revelation and this thing is, is solid. This thing is watertight. This thing is error-proof. There are people that say, well, what about all the contradictions? Here's what you do with a person that says, what about all the contradictions? You say, can you show me one right now? Because it's a common smokescreen for someone to throw out and say, what about all the contradictions? Just have them isolate one for you, and guess what? They can't. And then if someone is astute enough to maybe identify a supposed contradiction, then we have a conversation. But until they're able to isolate one area where there's a contradiction, guess what? You're in the right, they're in the wrong. The Bible is, I've devoted my life to it. Because why? It is the truth. I believe 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is inspired by God. It is literally God-breathed. And it is profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness so that the man and woman of God can be equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So the moment someone discredits the character of Christ or they're trying to tear away from the, 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 you know, the, the, the scriptures, you need to be careful because these are deceivers in Antichrist. And John is saying you are called to protect the truth. And I'm going to tell you, we live in a culture that it gets more and more difficult to protect the truth. Because why? Then you're labeled unloving. You're labeled unloving. And this is why the spirit in which we body, the, the, the character of Christ, is important as what we say about what we believe. Right? We need to embody grace. We need to embody kindness. We need to embody compassion. And we don't need to be harsh and bitter. We need to have a spirit in which we say, here are our convictions, here are the things we won't compromise on, and we need to do it in a way where there's gentleness and respect involved. Amen? So what I'm saying with Second John is this. Have truth that you never compromise on. We've got, this is one of those kind of churches, isn't it? All right, yes. Someone's going, oh, this is a raise your hand kind of church. Ask your question, Danielle. Sure. Real quick, Roman Catholicism teaches that salvation is partly earned by Jesus and partly earned by you. It's not all Jesus. That's why you can never ask a Catholic today, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? None of them have that assurance. That's why you've got to call the priest in to deliver last rites and hope they get there. So Catholic theology teaches that it is not only what Jesus has done. It's almost like he's giving you kind of like he's opened the door, but you've got to do the rest to hopefully get to heaven. And that's why they put such a premium on giving and church attendance and you know every time the church is open you're attending mass and this and that and so uh salvation is not the salvation communicated in scripture ephesians chapter 2 for salvation is by faith you know by grace through faith and that's all because of jesus and nothing because of you 
So that's a skewed. So there, see, and I love Catholics. Trust me. I, I mean, I love Mormons. I love Jehovah's Witnesses. But we've got to be very clear when it comes to the theology because there's people in Roman Catholic settings that are hearing a false theology. It's not the gospel that's communicated in Scripture. That's why a lot of the, the, the priests, you know, they'll do the homily, they'll do the interpretation, but Catholics are rarely in the word themselves because you'll become a Martin Luther and you'll discover what the Bible truly teaches and then you'll protest and then all of a sudden the world's lit on fire for something good, right? Because now truth is out there, it's in the light, and now it's all Jesus ac- accomplishing my salvation and not part of it do, do upon me. Does that make sense? Good question. Okay, so we are called to practice the truth. We are called to protect the truth. And John says you are to avoid the two errors. And at times you're called to protect truth like we just did, right? Like I just gave you a two-minute little soundbite piece of theology that's important. Because either salvation is all of Christ or it's not. And if it's not of Christ, what is it? It's up to you. Well, good luck with that. Amen? Verse 11. Or verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. Pretty harsh words. Yet, what John is saying is that you need to be careful with your associations that somehow, some way, through your actions and your behaviors, you're not authenticating or endorsing what the false teachers are saying. You can still be friendly toward them. But the moment someone comes knocking on my door and there's two guys wearing suits that just rolled up on their bikes and they want to have a conversation about eternal life, that's the moment when I don't invite them into my house. You want to know why? Because right at the door, I'll tell them what I clearly believe in Jesus. I'll encourage them to seek the true Jesus because I invite them in and all of a sudden a neighbor sees me invite them in. That is almost a visible approval of what they're teaching. And my neighbor goes, oh, he just invited the Mormons into his house. And then they go next door and they say, hey, the pastor next door allowed us in to have a cup of coffee. And you need to be careful. Have the conversation at the door. Encourage them to seek the true Jesus because the true Jesus is not the one that they're worshiping. And don't invite them in. But now if all of a sudden a Muslim exchange student wants to stay at your house for the night, that's a whole different story. If your unbelieving atheist brother wants to sit at the table on Thanksgiving, you're not putting him at the kids' table in the backyard. Sometimes you want to do that, don't you, though? You see what I'm saying? There's a difference between fully endorsing heresy, heretical teaching, and you need to be careful. That's why you'll never see Missio Day Church say, hey, I'm going to invite my Jehovah's Witness friends up here. We want to give them a warm welcome. Let them preach a sermon, and then we're going to send them off with a love gift as far as a financial offering. No! We don't do that. Right? We support those who support the true gospel. We support those who communicate and know the true Christ. And so that's why John uses these harsh, seemingly harsh words. Don't even invite them into your house. For the one who gives them a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Verse 11. Having many things to write to you, I do not want you to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be full. Here's what I love about John. He's like, no more emails, no more text messages. Let me just be with you in person. As if those things existed 2,000 years ago, right? The children of your chosen sister greet you. Third John. Verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. All right, so John starts the letter the same way. The elder. Don't need to go into it again. But the emphasis now in this letter is directed towards an individual person whose name is Gaius. Gaius is a church leader. Gaius is probably an apprentice, an intern, under John's teaching. He probably came to know the Lord through John's ministry. And now Gaius is one of the leaders in the church. And the emphasis of this letter is going to be act in love. Because he's writing to this church leader because there's somebody in the church community that's not acting in in love. And his name is Diotrephes. And you're going to find about, out about him in verse 9. Look at verse 1, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Now, what I love about that little opening right there in verse 2 with this little postcard is he says, I, I not only want you to be in good health physically, but there's nothing more important than spiritual health. Amen? Here, 
people, don't be preoccupied with your physical appearance. Be preoccupied with your heart. This is not saying you can't exercise, you can't diet. But you know what? More people are concerned about the pimple on their cheek than the rottenness in their soul. Amen? See, there's a preoccupation in our culture that images everything, right? If you believe the whole spite, Sprite advertising deal. And God's going to say to you, image and appearance, everything eventually goes the way of the buffalo, but there's nothing that is a substitute for taking care of and tendering your heart. See, I want you to be in good health, Gaius, as your soul prospers. How are you prospering your soul? It's a great question, isn't it? Am I allowing my soul to prosper? Am I preoccupied with soul food, soul exercise, soul diet? And I'm going to tell you right now, you take care of your heart. You know what? I believe God's going to direct your steps in other things. Verse 3. For as I was glad when brethren came and bore witness to your truth, that is how you are walking in the truth. Now notice he used the same phrase in 2 John. Because why? Nothing delights John more than to hear that his kids are walking in the truth. His kids are obeying the Lord. And there's five things I want to draw out here concerning love. The first is this, love in obeying or joyful obedience. Love and joyful obedience. He loves the fact that these people are not only joyfully obeying the Lord in their lives, but that he derives joy from their obedience. Verse 4, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. No greater joy to know that his people, his disciples, the people he's pastored are obeying the Lord in their lives. And just like I said just a few moments ago, nothing delights me more than to hear of you all honoring God in your lives. Amen. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you've accomplished for the brethren and especially when they're strangers. You have not only shown love to those that are, uh, that are in your circle of friendship, but you've even showed love to those that are strangers. And I love the little mysterious verse found in Hebrews where it talks about the ministry to strangers being that where some of you have entertained angels unaware. That that person that you don't even know comes into your life, you show them kindness, you show them love, and one day you may know in eternity that that was actually an angel that you had entertained without even you knowing it. So be careful when it comes to strangers. Be careful when it comes to people you don't know, and don't reject them outright. Perhaps God is sending a total stranger into your world so that you may have an opportunity to extend kindness, which brings us to number two. There's love in, what? Biblical hospitality. See, John is saying that there are going to be people that are going to come into your, 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 your life that you may not know. Don't reject them right away. Just because you don't know them doesn't mean this is not an opportunity for you to get to know them. And obviously there were people, strangers, that were coming into Gaius' church who knew Christ, who loved Christ. They came to know Christ at the, in the next region over or the other city, and all of a sudden they came and he says, and especially those who may, you may not know who know Jesus, show them hospitality. Some of you are great in showing hospitality. Some of you need a lot of work in the area of hospitality. Amen? That, you know what, you have an extra seat at the table. You have an extra bedroom in your house. Uh, I was even talking to someone the other day who said, you know, they had met somebody who had, had been sleeping in their car the week prior, and they got a note, and they said, hey, I've got an extra bed in my home. I said, yes, that's exactly it. To be ready and willing to accept someone, to give someone a shelter over their head at night, to give them a warm plate of food for, for dinner, whatever. I actually had a friend call me, my best friend who lives in uh, Albuquerque. Uh, he had called me a, a year ago and said, Hey, I have a favor to ask you. Are you ready to extend some biblical hospitality to somebody? And I was like, oh, great. And I'm like, I'm totally game for that. But I'm like, hey, honey, are you ready to show biblical hospitality to somebody we don't know? And, of course, first reaction was like, who is it, right? Like, but because my friend had endorsed this person, because my friend knows this person, had known them for many years, this guy was moving 
from Albuquerque to Southern California and just wanted a place to stay one night here in Phoenix. And my wife and I looked at each other and said, sure. And so we kind of braced the children, right? We said, we're going to have a total stranger come stay at our house. And they're kind of like, what? Somebody we don't, none of us know is going to live here? And I said, just for one night. Well, it ended up that something happened and the whole deal didn't take place. But the fact that we were ready to receive somebody, that, it was kind of awesome feeling. Like there was something more exciting than we, that week than to entertain a total stranger in our house. But yet this is the way it was in the first century because there were no hotels or there wasn't the Ritz-Carlton Jerusalem. Like just stay the night there. I know the, the concierge, they'll set you up, club level. There was none of that. People were dependent upon the hospitality of others. And what a great gift to give somebody, right? Save your money. Don't go spend on dinner. Come, come, come dine with us. Don't spend a night on a hotel room. Come stay with us. We have an extra bed. So John is praising Gaius and the church, saying, you've been kind to strangers. And verse 6, they bear witness of your love before the church, and you do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. How would God treat them? Like, how would God set them up? This reminds me of a funny story. You know, when we collect items for, like, charity, you know, we, we, we need to think about the people who are going to receive these things. And, you know, what? we're not going to give them, you know, jeans with holes in the crotches. You know, this is, this is not something. They're not going to give them socks that smell. Like, I wore these to the gym for 20 years straight. Here, you, you have these socks, and I want to donate them to you. You treat people as if they were Jesus. And, and would you give Jesus jeans with the holes in the crotch? I know some of you are going, like, we hear the word crotch. When, when are you, where else are you going to hear the word crotch in church? But I'm serious, we treat those that have need as if, you know, it's like they're not Jesus. I'm just going to give them this one. We need to treat people as if they were Jesus themselves. Would you give Jesus old gym socks or would you go out and say, I'm going to buy you a whole 12-pack of brand new socks. Here you go. I'm going to buy you new jeans. You need some shirts? I'm not going to give you the ratty, tatty shirts like I hang in my closet. I'm going to buy you something brand new. See, this is how God blesses. This is how God shows hospitality, right? Gives people the best. But notice what he says, verse 6. He says, These send them on their way in a manner worthy of God, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Third point, love in gospel funding. Meaning there's a level of financial generosity in the early church because these people that obviously were being entertained and show, being shown hospitality were doing the work of the gospel. They were doing work in the name and what's the name capital n jesus and these are not people who are called to go to unbelievers to solicit funds for their work this is a responsibility of the church to support those workers that are doing work for the name and there is a biblical precedent for support of pastors and church leaders and people going out and having a full-time vocation where their work is the work of the name. And I thank you that you're a church that supports me and my family, that I don't have to go to unbelievers to try to solicit support. You do it. And so the gospel funding that you guys contribute at Missio Day partly goes to me and my family. Thank you. Because now you have freed me up to do the work of ministry. And I'm going to tell you right now that we also extend that generosity to others as well. As far as Slovenia, as far as Turkey, as far as Brazil, even in our local community context of Phoenix in the metropolitan area, we financially support those who need the support because unbelievers aren't going to support them. Nor are these people called to go to unbelievers to seek support. It is a responsibility of the church. Amen? This is why you work at schools and Intel and all different places so that part of your finances goes to the work of the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not going to deliver a message on generosity this morning. Guess what's going to happen over the next two weeks? Yep, every year we do a little mini-series on generosity. So the first two Sundays in December are going to be focused on this theme because here's why, two reasons. Number one, it's the best Christmas gift I can give you this year and every year because you are being wooed and enticed by advertising. Buy this, spend money on that, 
And all of you are guilty of spending money you don't have to buy things you don't need to impress friends you don't even have. So let's just realize that's the truth of it. But secondly, I have a responsibility as your pastor to teach you the theology of generosity. And you have a responsibility to be a generous people. And when it comes to the topic of money, I love it. I talk to pastors like, I don't want to talk about money. I'm like, I love it. I wish I could talk about money every Sunday. But no, that wouldn't be good, right? But generosity, next few Sundays we're going to talk about what does generosity look like in the life of a believer. We'll tackle that over the next two weeks. So I'll leave it at that. Plus we have Financial Peace University starting the beginning of 2018. And if you've never taken Financial Peace University, this is your chance. And that is led by Kevin and Donna Fagerberg, who are out of town this weekend. But people who have been a part of it have had a transformation of their lives like you wouldn't believe. Greg's nodding his head back there. Amen. Sarah, Zach, you guys. Yep. Amen. So people are being changed. And how you see money directly affects how you understand the gospel. More on that next week. Fourth point. Love in Christ-like humility. How are we doing on time? Okay, good. We're doing all right. We're navigating this pretty fast, aren't we? Yeah? No? You guys still with us? Okay. We're in 3 John verse 9 right now, just to give you guys all a, a reference point. Now, all of a sudden, John is the bearer of bad news, and he calls someone out. Can you imagine a letter from the elder calling you out in the early church? Now, let me talk to you about a guy named Diotrephes. And you can just know, know that the name, once it's mentioned, people go, Oh, yeah, that guy. And I'm going to tell you, the reason John calls him out is because Diotrephes is a leader in the early church. And he wants to be the boss. And I'm going to tell you right now that there is nothing wrong with putting into place leaders and, and even having strong leaders. But there is something incredibly unhealthy in any church context where the leader is so overbearing, so power, overpowering that he wants to be in control and he wants to be in control of everything. So much so he's even kicking people out of the church that are going to try to buy control from his hands. So he calls Diotrephes out. Look at verse 9. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. He's basically saying, this guy wants to be numero uno. That is Greek, just in case you guys were wondering. And in that verse, it's almost like John had written a letter that Diotrephes tossed away. Like he got a letter, he says, I'm not reading this to the church, crumbles it up and throws it away. So could there have been a third John and this is really fourth John? Possibly. Can you imagine getting a letter from John and being like, garbage, Psh, toss it. And then John goes, they never got my letter? All right, here we go again. And this time it got into the right hands, a guy named Demetrius you're going to meet here in a moment. He delivers it to the church and John calls out Diatrophes and says, you are prideful see there's no doctrinal error going on here there's no doctrinal differences between john and diatrophies but there is a personality conflict in which diatrophies is not exhuming the humility of christ he's not demonstrating christ-like humility verse 10 for this reason if i come now notice, there's almost a veiled threat in John's voice. Like, even though he's 80 plus years old, guess what? This guy, he's a bulldog. If I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and he forbids those who desire to do so, and puts them out of the church. So right there, he calls them out on four things. Number one, he says, he puts himself first, and I'm going to tell you what, if we do not learn to demonstrate Christ-like humility, self-love will always destroy fellowship. If we don't think of un one another first, this fellowship will not be everything God wants it to be. Philippians chapter 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but consider one another more important than yourself. And then he says, and who's the greatest model of this? Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. You can read that whole section there. 
And he says, Diotrephes is not demonstrating this kind of behavior. Should somebody like this be a leader in the church? I'm going to tell you right now that if a church is being led by someone that's not a pastor but more like a rancher, beware. Pastors are called to be shepherds not ranchers. Pastors are supposed to know the flock, to be intimately connected to them. And if they're running the church like a CEO, well, guess what? There's a reason why the church is more like a business and less like a family. This is why I believe this is a strong argument for the mega church. Because when the pastor, who's supposed to be a shepherd, has no connection with the sheep, how is he pastoring? I'll leave it at that. Number two thing he's guilty of. He uses malicious and slanderous words against John. I mean, what are you going to say about the beloved John, the apostle of love? And yet he's saying unkind things. And guess what? You guys can say whatever you want about me. Just say it to my face. Don't be saying it behind the scenes because guess what? Word will get around and then you and I will have to have that conversation. Right? Like, no, we don't, we don't treat each other like that. You have something to say, say it to me. But because you don't have a leg to stand on, diatrophies, you've got to say it behind John's back. Well, guess what? So we're going to get to John about what you're saying, and John's not going to tolerate it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good for the, for the moment, the need of the moment, Let your words be seasoned with grace, right? Building up, not tearing down. Edifying, not destroying. You may disagree with me. Just don't be disagreeable in your disagreeing. Amen? Right? You got something to say? Let's sit down and talk. That's how we grow as disciples. But when it's malicious and when it's slanderous and when it's nasty... That is just not Christ-like. And I'll tell you what, I have been the victim. I have, I have borne the brunt of things. And there is a bulldog inside of me that's like, what? You know, and I, and I want to go like full Popeye on people, you know, like, what? You know, but I don't. Why? Because malicious and slanderous words will come and will go, but the one thing that will withstand any accusation falsely brought against you, your character. Who you are in Christ, what you know to be, and what you know to be before the Lord will stand. And I'll tell you, it's taken years with some things that have been said. And people have come through the woodwork and said, you know what? We need to seek your forgiveness. We heard things, we believed things, and you know what? We found out them to be false. Nothing can destroy the years that the locusts have eaten, but I will tell you that the Lord's power to restore the soul, knowing what, who you are and what you've done before Him, is always right. When you're honest before the Lord, boy, there's an amazing ministry in that. So don't, don't fight every battle. You're going to have your critics, you know. Don't fight every battle. The battle belongs to who? The Lord. Number three, he did not show hospitality. The people that he, he should have been showing hospitality to, doing the work for Jesus, he didn't. And then there were people in the church that wanted to, and he found them, and he threw them out. So here's a guy who wasn't even supporting the gospel work, and if he found out you were supporting it, he didn't like that because obviously that was in line with John, and if you're on John's team, you can't be on Diatrophy's team, and so he's going to show you the door. So all these wonderful people are being kicked out of the church, and fourth, that was the point. He didn't show hospitality to people, and then number four, he kicked people out that did show hospitality. This guy's a real piece of work. I'm going to tell you right now, That the church is filled with people with different goals, with different agendas, with different ambitions. But you've got to keep your ambitions in check. There's nothing wrong with ambition. But I'm going to give you four words. I want you to write these down in your notes. This is bonus points. Ambition that leads to arrogance will eventually lead to accusations, which will then lead to actions. And that's what happened to diatrophies. See, he didn't have a godly ambition, which I would say godly ambition is that which is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. We make it our aim to please him. Was Diatrophes pleasing the Lord? No. 
But his ambition led him to a place where he had to bring false accusations or, or his arrogance was so built up that he had to bring false accusations to make himself look better than, than the Apostle John. And then that led to actions which ultimately brings discredit because now here's a man's name that will go down throughout history. He's, his name's found in the Word of God. Can you imagine having like, here's Cheryl's name, right? At least the woman caught in the act of adultery of John chapter 8 was nameless. Right? Because God's like, no, you know what? She, there's guilt, there's shame. You know, I'm going to deliver her from that. The woman at the well, did she have a name in John 4? No. But God is going to call out somebody who doesn't demonstrate the spirit of Christ. And he does so here. I'm grateful my name's not there. Amen? Dustin! Your name, nope, you're not there, buddy. You're safe, all right? Steve, you're there? Nope, you're not there either, bro. But here's diatrophies. Why? Because he's a man who was so set on his kingdom, he forgot God's kingdom. Which then leads us to number five. Love and healthy communication. And I close with this. So he says, Beloved, verse 11, do not imitate what is evil, but do what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. So basically he's saying, diatrophies is evil. Don't follow his model. Find the people in your life that model Christ. Bad company corrupts good character. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Can I say that again? Bad company corrupts good character. Surround yourself with people who love Christ, who are desperate for Jesus, who yearn for Jesus, who live out of a worshiping life. Demetrius. Now there's a third character. I'm going to tell you who Demetrius is. He's the deliverer of the letter. He's the guy that was like hightailing it over the hills and through the glen bringing the postcard to the church. And Demetrius was obviously someone who also did the work of ministry. He worked for the name. And Demetrius brings the letter. And Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone. So basically John is saying, Demetrius is good. Show him hospitality. Demetrius is a good guy. Show him gospel funding. Demetrius is a good guy. He's not like diatrophies. He's a humble servant. And he says, we wish we were there to bear witness, and you know that our witness is true. And then verse 13, I had many things to write to you, but I'm not writing, willing to write them to you now with pen and ink. Verse 14, but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Notice he ended Second John the same way. Because in John's world, nothing meant more than to have face-to-face conversation with each other. And in a day and age where there's a lot of substitutes, be careful. You have a disagreement with somebody, don't blast off a text. You have an issue with somebody, don't shoot off an email. I swear, if I get an email and I'm like, if if it's more than a couple sentences, I'm like, I don't have time to read someone's dissertation on, on why they don't like me or whatever their complaint is. If you have an issue with somebody, the biblical way to go about it is face to face. With family members. I know too many families that I've personally counseled that have used text messaging as substitute from a sit-down conversation. While social media, Facebook, and texting, and emailing can be such a wonderful tool, consider the ways it's destroying our connectivity as human beings. And if you have something to say to somebody... Set up a one-on-one meeting with them face-to-face because that is the most God-honoring form of communication. Amen? They can see your posture. They can hear the tone of your voice, the inflections on certain words. See, when you read a text message, you're not emphasizing the right things that they want you to emphasize. Right? So be careful. But notice how he finishes his last phrase. Peace be to you. The friends greet you and greet The friends by name. Why do I love that? Because John knew the people by name. And when you have church leaders that know you by name, there's something wonderful in that. Like, can you say hi to Aaron for me? And and let Carolyn know we're praying for her. And you remember what was going on with Steve the other day? Yeah, tell him we're praying for... And all of a sudden, like, he knows my name. And not only does he know my name, he knows about my life. He knows what's going on in my world. And that's why we pray for you. 
That's why we say, let us pray, and the leadership every week gets an email with your name and your prayer requests. And we come together, and the leaders will go, hey, how's Mary doing? And what's going on with John this week? And we're able to know one another by name. And we know one another by name. We know what's going on in each other's lives. And when we know what's going on in each other's lives, we know what to praise God for and what to pray for. And we are a family. Amen? Versus just having a place card at the spot. And it's just like, insert your name here. We don't know who you are, but we're glad you're here. And who wants that? Who wants to be invited to the dinner and no one know you? We are called to know and be known. And that's the message. Abide in truth, act in love. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Second and third John, was that good? Did you guys, uh, did you glean something new from these postcards? Go back and read them this week. They're, they're truly wonderful, wonderful words given by God to us. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for not only giving us truth, but giving us a capacity to love, to love you, to love others. And my prayer would be for us to always find on a daily basis the balance between having truth where we don't compromise and embracing a love that has no boundaries. And Lord, what that looks like in its day-to-day application, I believe your Spirit will show us. But more importantly, let us demonstrate the Spirit of Christ. Let us communicate the truth of Christ to every person we meet. Lord, because we have opportunities to share that love with so many people. So thank you, Father, for this morning, the fact that we have so much to be grateful for. Thank you, Lord, for loving us in Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord uh, continue to lift his face toward you, give you grace and peace and mercy forever and ever. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you guys soon, all right?